Good afternoon. I see when I usually talk, people stop. So I'm accustomed to that. Good afternoon. My name is Gary Anderson. I'm co-founder and producing artistic director for Plowshares Theater Company. I'd like to welcome you here to this symposium, Hastings Street, looking back to bring forward. I'm very happy also to recognize the partners with which who have helped me make this happen, including Detroit Future Cities and uh, Black Bottom Archives, two nonprofits here in this city that work diligently on issues of economic equity, storytelling, racial justice. We partner because Plowshares is doing this play called Hastings Street, a um, world-class musical, and it was designed on really trying to present to us the untold story of the, dis the, the destruction of a black community. Quite frankly, what we're looking to do is use this project as a way of raising awareness. We have at times assumed that the inequities or uh, challenges of communities within places are something that are cropped up within a few days, few years, few decades. And in actuality, those things occur because of events that happened 50, 60, 70 years prior that have never been addressed. Issues of harm that need to be repaired. That is what reparations is about, repairing past harms. It is part of the mission of equity. Equity is not just, equity is not equal, it is just and it's fair. And so today we're gonna to talk about looking at the, the, the destruction of that of Black Bottom and see how it has ramifications on the Detroit that we see today. And I'm very happy to announce the panelists that are here with us. Ken Coleman, who is a local historian and also a reporter for Michigan Advance. Could you come up to see? We also have Executive Director P.G. Watkins from Black Bottom Archives, who will also come up here. You can right here, yeah. Um, Executive Vice President of Detroit for Two Cities, Ashley Clark, who will be bringing data from their 21 economic equity report that they presented. We'll be talking a little bit more about both BBA and DFC in regards to activities they're gonna have going forward, and we're encouraging you to participate. This is not just a forum where we will be bringing up people to speak about um, the events, but also trying to encourage you to get engaged in trying to address these repairs. And last but not least, I'd like to bring Chase Cantrell, who is Executive Director of Building Community Value. He will be talking about economic development currently as it sits in Detroit and how that impacts. So once again, I want to thank you for your, your attendance. Please come in, take a seat and I will give the podium over to Ken, Col Ken Coleman. Thank you. Thank you, Gary Anderson. Give him another uh, round of applause. He's certainly doing great work in this community. And uh, when he reached out to me, uh, as I'm sure he reached out to my uh, esteemed uh, colleagues on the panel, uh, and, and asked would, uh, would I be interested in, in presenting uh, on this topic. I told him yes, 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 and yes. And so uh, always, uh, always exciting to talk about this topic. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, as Gary pointed out, um, I'm a reporter at uh, michiganadvance.com. We are a Lansing-based news site, uh, politics and, and, and uh, policy news site. Um, and one of the cool things about writing for Michigan Advance, although we're really, we're certainly Lansing based, and a big part of our work is, is writing about the, our state capital and the in, uh, comings and goings there. Uh, one of the great things I'm afforded to do, uh, as, as some of you follow me on social media, I do as well, um, uh, spend a lot of time talking about um, the history of black folk um, in this town. Um, I, I use the phrase chronicling black life in Detroit um, is not only a passion of mine, um, but it is, um, as uh, we all sort of know, um, what, uh, nothing is new under the sun. And, and some of the things that we've um, seen here as uh, black folk in America, uh, and certainly in Detroit, 
Um, we see some of those things happening over and over again. And so some of the terms we'll undoubtedly talk about, I know I'll talk about in my brief presentation, is um, gentrification and uh, the movement uh, of, 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 of people out of communities, um, oftentimes bringing people better, uh, more means um, in those communities. That is certainly the story uh, of Black Bottom. Um, so what I'm gonna do, I've got a series of slides, and I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I forgot my notes, although I probably should know this stuff backward and forward, but I wanna stay on time and target. Uh, and so uh, the photo that you see on the lead slide is, is a photo uh, from uh, the community that was known as Black Bottom. Uh, and it, it was very typical, this, these, uh, uh, this residential uh, shot, uh, very typical of the landscape uh, in, in that particular community. People often ask me, uh, where was Black Bottom? And that's probably the most popular question uh, that I get in, in our next slide. I'll talk a little bit about uh, the name and the geography. Now, Black Bottom, the name itself. Now, people, uh, people don't always agree uh, Brother Jordan, Brother Javon Jordan, uh, fellow, fellow historian out there, good to see you. Uh, people don't always agree on how the term Black Bottom uh, came to be. Uh, certainly there was a sense that once the, the community was largely black, uh, uh, certainly majority black, uh, some people just got the sense that it was named Black Bottom because that's where a majority of the city's black folk lived in the 19 teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, there's another school of thought that suggests that the term Black Bottom goes back to the French settlers. Um, and because of the, um, the soil uh, in this part of town, certainly, uh, certainly south of Gratiot, uh, that was farmland, uh, farmland by the French settlers in the, in the 1700s. And so um, some people believe that name Black Bottom comes from uh, the darker, uh, darker colored soil, uh, fertile, fertile topsoil. So uh, we don't always agree on where the term came from, uh, it is a, a source of a lot of debate oftentimes, but that is a little bit of the history of the name. Now let's talk about the geography. Again, people don't always agree uh, on where Black Bottom was. Um, uh, there are people that, uh, I've interviewed people who were here uh, and active in the 30s and 40s, and they'll readily tell you Black Bottom is wherever, wherever black people were. <laughs> and that could be on the north end. <laughs> that could be in, in, in the land known traditionally as Black Bottom. That could be on the old west side. It might even be in Conant Gardens. So, so, but uh, generally when we think about Black Bottom, we're thinking about uh, a, a, a space of land south of Gratiot, uh, just south of here, a uh, thousand feet or so, 2,000 feet. Uh, 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 Gratiot being, for the most part, um, Gratiot and Werner being the northern boundary. Of, of what generally is thought to be Black Bottom. Uh, the western boundary um, is actually brush. It is not um, I-375 I or Old Hastings Street. Um, really, Black Bottom extended into what we know today as part of downtown Detroit. Uh, and so brush was the western uh, boundary. The eastern boundary is another one of those, uh, one of those, one of those issues and sources of debate. Uh, some, some people believe it uh, is the current day the Quinder Cut. Uh, where the railroad was, uh, just, uh, just south, I mean, uh, just east of here. Uh, some, people say it's, some people say it goes all the way to Elmwood Cemetery. I mean, I've heard people say that. And then the southern boundary, generally speaking, most people, uh, the, it's present-day Lafayette, um, although some people might say Congress. Um, it depends um, on the other southern boundary. This is a 1930 map, um, a portion of a 1930 map of Detroit. Um, and it has the old streets, the old layout. You don't see an I-375. Um, uh, it's Hastings Street at that time. Um, you, see, um, you don't see, obviously, the Dequindor Cut. Um, that, that did not exist, the railroad track all the way on the far uh, right side, the, the dotted, uh, dotted line, there's the railroad track, uh, current day, the Quinder Cut. So when we talk about Black Bottom, that's the general um, geography that we're talking about. And when you think about north of Gratiot, um, that immediate area, it was the Paradise Valley area, uh, the, the cultural and business um, hub of the, city of, the, of the city's black, uh, black community. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, this period photo um, gives you somewhat of a sense of what an African-American family would have looked like in Detroit uh, in the 1920s. I picked that photo because I wanted to point out that Detroit's population um, was expanding, uh, was expanding in, a, in a, a very significant way. 
in the 19-teens and 1920s. The city in general was becoming a much larger city, uh, becoming larger and larger by the decade. Uh, African Americans began to move uh, to the city. Um, first of all, we've, all, we've been here since the 1700s, and a lot of people don't know that. Um, we've always had black people here, but by uh, 1910, the city's population, black population, is about 5,700 5, people, uh, a little bit more than 5,000 people. 20 years later, by 1930, that 5,700 expands to 120,000. Black folks hear the clarion call by uh, Henry Ford, um, that he has uh, mastered um, the, the, uh, the assembly line. Um, black folks from the South hear about what, what they have heard uh, to be economic opportunities, um, a better life in the South, and tens of thousands of people, uh, like my grandparents, uh, maternal and, uh, maternal and uh, uh, paternal grandparents, uh, moved here uh, in the 1920s. Um, and so, uh, one other point I want, before we go to the next slide, uh, Black Bottom at that time, uh, certainly by the 1930s or 40s, had a population, and not a population, had a, a, a business, uh, a set of businesses that, that uh, they are different numbers. Some people say about 350, some people say more than that. Um, but certainly by the 1930s, uh, the black community is very sizable. As I mentioned, 120,000 people. Detroit becomes the fourth largest city in America. Anika, imagine that. The fourth largest city in America. Only New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia are larger. And that's before, you know, lots of folks start moving out west, and, and obviously Los Angeles becomes a top, top, th uh, top three city. Uh, so Detroit was the place to be for, because we were building things, right? Industry was uh, what we did, in, a, in addition to the, the automobile industry and, and ancillary businesses. And that brought black families uh, here. What they found, though, is that their existence um, in Detroit was only slightly better than where they came from. In fact, uh, for the most part, African Americans are relegated to that black bottom community. Now, that's not to say that there weren't blacks living in other places in the 1920s and 30s. We did have a small and growing middle class community in the new development called Conant Gardens. Um, that by 1925, um, there were hundreds of blacks there. Uh, there were blacks on what we call the Old West Side. How many people uh, know that area? Tyerman, uh, Epworth, um, uh, Northwestern High School, was a big, big hub there. Um, so there were certainly families there in the 1920s. Uh, uh, Damon Keith's family was from there. Uh, John Conyers' family moves from the, from the east side to uh, the west side. The Gordys lived on both sides, uh, uh, spending some time in that old west side area and spending some time uh, uh, here uh, near the Arts Center. Next slide, please. So what happened to Black Bottom? The beginning of the end really starts in the 1940s. Uh, a developer, a New York developer uh, named Eugene Greenhut, Eugene Greenhut. Uh, come, goes to uh, then Mayor Edward Jeffries Jr. Uh, not the freeway, but the mayor. Uh, goes to uh, uh, Je Jeffries Jr. and says, I've got a development idea. I, I did this in New York. I'd like to, um, uh, I'd like to uh, lay out some development opportunities for you um, here in Detroit. And, and Jeffries listens to Green Hut. And Green Hut proposes, at least in 1944, proposes uh, two developments on, on either side of Woodward Avenue. On the west of Woodward, uh, a, a, a community that was aging, but that was largely white. Uh, and that's in the area now where uh, Masonic Temple is, if you think about streets like Temple uh, and the like, it was generally in that area. The other project, the project east of Woodward, was Black Bottom. And so uh, Jeffries goes to his uh, city council, of course then we called them common councils, um, uh, Jeffries goes to his common council and says, I'd like, to, um, I'd like your support on these two developments. The folks, on the, fo folks west of Whit Woodward went ballistic. I mean, white folk, largely white folk, they, they, they went down to city council with placards, no, you're not doing this, and uh, Jeffries backs off. And he actually backs off on the Black, on the, uh, uh, black Bottom uh, uh, opportunity, at least for a few years. It does come back. Uh, and so there's a lot of conversation about what Albert Cobo was and wasn't, uh, the city's former mayor in the 1950s. Albert Cobo did not, uh, he certainly carried out the raising of Black Bottom, but it wasn't his idea. 
Uh, it was actually more to the point, it was uh, Mayor Jeffries' Mayor Jeffries's idea. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, Kobo uh, carries out the raising of Black Bottom, which really starts in about 1949. And by 1953, much of that community uh, had been raised. It, it, it lay dormant. And it lay dormant for three or four years. Kobo, at the, the mayor at the time, could not get a private sector developer to rebuild that community. Kobo wanted a community that, uh, at least in the, originally, he wanted a community that would keep uh, uh, middle, class folks, middle class folks in Detroit from moving out to suburbs. Detroit was already starting to experience a population decline. Our population, as you probably know, topped out at nearly 2 million people in 1950, 1 1.8 million um, to be exact. It's, 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 it's wild to think about it when you think of a city now that has about 700,000 people. But Kobo dies. Uh, Kobo dies in his third term, uh, has a fatal heart attack in 1957. By that time, Black Bottom had already been raised, and the, 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 the community that we know today as Lafayette Park had already began um, to, to spring up. Uh, the Lafayette Pavilion, uh, the luxury apartments, at least that's how they were described when they were built, the Lafayette Pavilion had just opened in 1957, or they had, some of the first tenants um, had, had moved in in 1957. So Kobo dies, and Mariani, Louis Mariani, the city council president, takes over as mayor and carries out this plan, uh, the plan to tra transform Old Black Bottom to, to Lafayette Park. Uh, next slide, please. And so we began to hear terms um, uh, in, in, in the community uh, like condemnation, uh, er, uh, eminent domain, uh, the phrase that became popular in the black community about what they were seeing uh, going on in Old Black Bottom, uh, the phrase uh, uh, urban renewal means Negro removal. One of the persons that was removed was Sadie, uh, Sadie Bell. Sadie, Dave, uh, Sadie uh, Bell Davis. Um, Ms. Davis was a 75-year-old black woman who was surviving on her late husband's uh, pension, um, had, was bringing little money home other than that. She owned a home um, on Maple Street in Old Black Bottom, uh, and in 1951, it was condemned by the city of Detroit. Now, the uh, city did not literally throw people out. They did, make they did negotiate with homeowners for a very modest uh, uh, fee to, to purchase, the, purchase the home. But for people like uh, Ms. Davis, 75 years old, had lived on Maple Street for decades, uh, wasn't, didn't have a lot of income, the $2,500 that the city of Detroit offered her was, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a small piece of change, all right? I mean, $1951. I mean, $2,500 is not a drop in the bucket, but it certainly wasn't enough necessarily for her, for her to buy a home in Detroit. And Anika, again, you know that not only did we have um, the raising of Black Bottom, but there were few places where black people could live in Detroit. I mentioned those two or three communities, but outside of Kona Gardens, the old west side, uh, and, and maybe some other smaller parts of the city, there weren't, a lot of black, there weren't a lot of places for black people to go. And that was one of the, um, probably the, the worst thing about the raising of Black Bottom was, it wasn't like black folk could get up and just move and go someplace else. Most of the people, in fact, were renters. They weren't even homeowners. So Ms. Davis was, was fortunate, um, not necessarily representative. She at least uh, was able to secure $2,500 from the city of Detroit. But if you were renting, and you go to your door one day and you see a notice on your door that she's pretty tough days before uh, you're gonna get thrown out by the city of Detroit. Well, that's, that's, that's pretty tough. And couple that with the fact that you can't move to Rosedale Park. You can't move to the city's northeast side. You, know, you can't move to the far west, uh, far west side. I mean, in 1951, there were very few black folks that were living uh, along 12th Street. I mean, that began to change uh, in that decade. But, but that was the state of affairs. This is a uh, 1966 uh, Detroit Free Press story uh, talking about Mrs. Davis's plight. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, Lafayette Park begins in earnest, uh, certainly in by 1956. Uh, the, this slide kind of shows you some of the early uh, building and development, uh, the, the, the noted Vanderoe homes, uh, an aerial shot of, of uh, 
of the uh, Lafayette Park community. And uh, the fact that it has become Lafayette Park uh, a historical landmark um, in, in a site that we, uh, the nation has looked at as uh, certainly a, a leader over the uh, innovator in terms of architecture. Um, Van der Rohe did homes all over the uh, uh, commercial and residential um, structures all over the country. Uh, and it, it, he is in, in the, the uh, Van der Rohe homes now, uh, some of the larger uh, some of the larger townhouses there are, are selling for six, seven hundred thousand um, dollars. Close to that anyway, if not that. Some of the larger ones anyway. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the early residents of Lafayette Park. Um, there's certainly a notion that uh, that Black Bottom was all black and Lafayette Park, Lafayette Park was all white. Well, it's not necessarily so. Um, certainly the 1970 census pointed out that three of every four people that lived in Lafayette Park were white, uh, but there were African Americans who lived uh, in that in that community. Uh, and some of some of the more noted names are uh, Congressman Charles Diggs, uh, uh, Judge Wade Wade McCree, uh, the father, uh, George Crockett uh, had owned a, a townhouse in the Van der Rohe homes, and even Barry Gordy and some of his children actually spent some of their childhood uh, in in Lafayette Park. Uh, McCree moves in, uh, probably is, was the earliest resident. McCree moved in in the, in the, in the uh, late 1950s uh, as, um, as, uh, as the Vanderbilt homes were beginning to uh, come online. Uh, next slide, please. And so, uh, it, it's also a misnomer that the building of, of I-375 destroyed Black Bottom. It's a misnomer because the reality is the freeway was really the last part of that development. The, 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 the homes, the residential community, um, the, the, move, the Lafayette Park uh, uh, community was really uh, the, the early replacement of Black Bottom. But by 1959, uh, Mayor, Julie, uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor Mariani excuse me, uh, is at a, a groundbreaking for the I-75 portion of the Chrysler Freeway. Uh, the first shot is an aerial shot. Actually, it's um, actually... Uh, looking Jefferson, looking east, um, that's uh, Jefferson at about a brush, uh, looking east, and as you know, uh, I-375 really kind of starts at Bobian, makes that quick uh, left turn and heads up uh, to, uh, up here to near, near Gratiot. The photo on the right is a photo of Hastings Street. We don't know the year. Uh, Jemani, have you been able to figure that one out? I know you've seen that photo before. Yeah, I, I, we don't know the year but we do have it documented as Hastings Street. Uh, and what you see is an, uh, several African-Americans walking along uh, that Hastings Street community, which was really um, a, a sort of main street uh, uh, business uh, thoroughfare, to be sure. Early 50s, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the groundbreaking starts uh, on I-375 uh, in January of 1959. It takes about four, about four years, about five years to complete uh, next slide, please. Um, and so that was the sort of uh, end part of the, of, of the uh, transformation from Black Bottom to Lafayette Park. Uh, just two more slides, Gary. This is a 1974 story. I, this, this is very important. And when I found this, I, 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 Jemaine knows I post it every year. And on July 29th, I'm going to post it again <laughs> on, the, on the anniversary of this, of this story. Um, it, it, it really sort of talks about the phrase that I mentioned earlier, urban renewal is Negro removal. Um, it actually, the headline is what's so telling about it, um, or the main sub-headline, sub urban renewal's first fiasco. And uh, in, the, in the story that the great Susan Watson wrote, the late great Susan Watson wrote, uh, the headline was, has the word fiasco because of the, of the very hasty way that black people were moved out of that community like Ms. Davis and, and many of them having no other place to go. Uh, this is in 1974, um, really admitting what should have uh, really been a clear understanding uh, some 20 years before that. Uh, final slide. This is the uh, uh, headline on the Detroit Free Press, front page Detroit Free Press, when uh, I-375 opened on June 26, 1964. And you can see how, it, I don't know if you can see very closely, but how different Detroit skyline looks um, uh, compared to today. Um, but this was thought to be a great day. 
uh, in Detroit history. Um, but what wasn't really told was the, the hundreds and probably thousands of, 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 of residents and businesses that were lost uh, in the name of urban renewal. I thank you for your time. I'm sorry I went a little bit over. I also should point out, uh, and actually I've got the wrong date there, the uh, Black Bottom Historical Marker was dedicated last summer uh, in 2021. But now there's more recognition of what happened to that community, uh, and it's been codified by a Michigan uh, historical marker that sits in the uh, Lafayette Central um, uh, uh, Park on Lafayette, uh, across the street from the Vanderbilt Homes and Chrysler Elementary School. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ken, I appreciate that. Um, so he sets up his history. Now we're gonna have P.G. Watson talk about archiving and storytelling and how we can use it as a tool for racial justice. All right, what up though, y'all? All right. I'm P.G. I use they, them pronouns. I'm the director and one of the co-founders I really didn't want to have to do this, but it sounds kind of wonky, huh? Um, I'm, one, I'm the director and one of the co-founders of Black Bottom Archives, which is a digital media platform dedicated to preserving the stories of Black Detroit in order to think about our current context and self-determine a different type of future. So um, I wanted to talk today I usually would spend some time setting up the history of Black Bottom, but Ken just did that very beautifully, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. But I am going to talk a bit about our work, why we started doing what we're doing, and how I see that fitting into this larger goal of equity and justice here in the city of Detroit. So um, Black Bottom Archives was started, we started it in 2014, really initially as a Tumblr blog as a place for, I don't know if folks are aware of Tumblr, but <laughs> it's an online blogging situation. And it really was a place for us to be like, there are stories that we want to hear, that we aren't hearing, that we can't find other places, but we know that particularly young black folks have something to say about what's happening right now. And when we called it Black Bottom Archives, it was much so more symbolic around, can we make the connection between the kinds of displacements that black Detroiters experienced in that history and the kind of displacement that black folks and longtime Detroiters are experiencing currently. We're experiencing and still are experiencing right now in the city. Um, and so we started off thinking of ourselves as a living archive, that we were guaranteeing that in 30, 50, 100 years, our histories wouldn't be forgotten in the same ways that black bottoms had been forgotten and dismissed in the same ways that it had been minimized. Um, and so we continued that mission uh, of storytelling, of preserving the story of Detroit with doing actual historical archiving of the Black Bottom neighborhood, talking to elders, collecting oral histories, compiling some research on the neighborhood so that there is a place that's accessible for people, all types of people with connections and relationships to Detroit, to be able to understand and experience the history of, the, of that particular neighborhood. Um, before we developed this digital archive, I think, um, most of what people learned about Black Bottom or how you learned about it was you were a historian or maybe you were studying history very specifically. Maybe you have family that lived in Black Bottom and so they shared stories about it. But otherwise, it wasn't a mainstream idea. It wasn't like a mainstream story that was told here in the city. Um, it wasn't something that I learned about in <laughs> Detroit public schools in middle school or high school. Right, I learned about it in college when I was studying African American studies at Wayne State. And, and my family also, ooh, I forgot I had that mic on, y'all. I'm sorry. Um, my family moved to the city of Detroit. Um, I have family that moved to Detroit and to Pontiac uh, both before and during the Great Migration, but my parents moved here in 1980 for work. So similar story of moving here from the South, uh, but a lot later than Black Bottom. So I don't have that personal connection. And the, the person who co-founded uh, Black Bottom Archives with me is a multi-generational Detroiter who has a direct connection to, Detroit, uh, to Black Bottom and really wanted to make sure that we continue to amplify that particular history. Um, so 
we can just kind of breeze through these next couple of slides because they were kind of the history setup stuff. We know that Detroit, ex Detroit's experience, as Ken laid out with displacement and gentrification and erasure, are like a lot of other major cities in, in the country, right? Actually, there were a lot of other black bottoms that existed across the country. Um, and because it wasn't something that people knew about or readily talked about, for us, it was this idea, the same concept of this particular symposium, um, looking back to look forward, right? This idea of Sankofa, which I actually have, one of my tattoos on my wrist is a Sankofa symbol, which is a West African symbol around how we honor our history because it's what ensures we can move forward, right? And so we see our work in that trajectory. So yeah, you can just go through the next couple slides real quick and you can land me after that one. This is just a little bit, I guess I'll just stop here just briefly to say, um, I think other folks will talk about it a bit later, but currently they are talking, they are developing this uh, project, trying to make I-375 a more walkable boulevard. And one, that was possible because of the stories people were telling about Black Bottom, because of the work that historical societies and, and community members like Ken Coleman, like Marsha Music, like Jamon Jordan who are here, and maybe many others of you did to get the historical marker for Black Bottom and to determine that that particular part of Detroit history is something that current elected officials and those who say they represent the city need to account for and repair. So this uh, project to me is a testament of the power of storytelling and the power of amplifying our stories so that people have to respect our history. And right, there's this tension, this contradiction with now they wanna do this project, right? Like who does it benefit? Who is it for? How are we gonna make sure that black Detroiters who are impacted by the development of that highway in the first place can benefit in some way or be, uh, get some type of reparative action for this new project? So I just wanted to talk about that briefly. Um, and I really just wanna talk a little bit more about the archiving work that we do um, with Black Bottom Digital Archive and Black Bottom Street View. So the Black Bottom Digital Archive um, and the Black Bottom Street View exhibit, if you go to the next slide, are opportunities to share what I consider to be very important lost histories in this city. Um, it's a way to challenge ourselves and our communities to make the important connections between historical practices of disposability and disinvestment um, and track them through to the conditions that we see in our present, right? When Gary opened today, he talked about how so much of what we're experiencing right now isn't the result of this most recent mayoral election, right? It's, it's actually decades upon decades in the making. And we have to be able to acknowledge what happened many decades ago, how it's um, developed and shifted and shaped who we are and how we relate to each other. So the Black Bottom Digital Archive specifically collects narratives, perspectives, and experiences of the historic Black Bottom neighborhood and it's a part of this larger mission that we have to cultivate and support the development and preservation of media created by and for black Detroiters. The next slide and the next couple of slides actually are pictures of the Black Bottom Street View exhibit, which uh, Black Bottom Archives acquired in 2018 from Emily Kudel, who is um, not a long time or lifelong Detroiter, but is a, an architect and a lover of history, someone who um, found out about the story of Black Bottom and wanted to figure out how to contribute to that story being told. Um, and this Black Bottom Street View exhibit really is about bringing forth the histories and the sacred spaces that were present in the neighborhood for people to experience in real time. So many young people, um, we can look at historic photos, right? We can, there's something about archival images and materials that is so important. And as someone who archives history, I can recognize the importance of that. Um, and being able to do what this project allows you to do, which is to sim simulate like walking through the streets of Black Bottom to be able to see the life that existed there. All of these images uh, were in the Burton Historical Collection. They were taken during the eminent domain process that happened over the course of the um, Negro removal that Ken just talked about and documented in our timeline. And it was this process of literally going parcel by parcel, which if y'all live in the city, y'all see people doing this today, right? In our neighborhoods, we see folks just walking around with their clipboard and a camera, Survey. taking, surveying, taking pictures of every single house down the street, every lot, right? 
And these images are those pictures that were taken right before Black Bottom was raised. Um, and in the documents, if you go to visit the Burton Historical Collection where these images are, along with all of the records that accompany them, you see the stories that are of the people who lived in those homes, like the business owners and the folks who uh, were there, who owned them, who lived in them, who rented them, what materials were they made out of, all these things were in, are in these documents. And so through these panoramic images, we see it as kind of like a Google street view, right? When you can zoom in on Google and you can kind of do the whole 360 view of what's around, right? We're wanting folks, both young people and intergenerationally, to be able to experience this history more directly. And then through the accompanying oral, oral histories that are on the website, it's a fully immersive experience that's really about making a place-based historical intervention. Um, so this right now is in storage, <laughs> to be honest, but it's been several places. It's a traveling exhibit. You might have seen it at the Detroit Public Library a couple of years ago. It was at um, the Detroit Symphony Orchestra right before the pandemic, actually, um, for their 100th uh, anniversary. It was at um, Wayne State University most recently and University of Liggett School in Gross Point, and continues to travel to many different places. And we're in the process of getting it refabricated. Right now, Emily actually and her students made this whole thing. Um, and we're in the process of getting it refabricated so that it can withstand and be outside for longer periods of time so that it can be a part of more community installations and the things like that. Um, so the next couple slides are just a little couple more images of Black Bottom Street View that we can run through. Um, and just to say that I don't see history from an objective point of view, right? I don't think that we can look at history apolitically without any political analysis or understanding of the social or historical context that we all exist in. And so I think projects like what we're trying to do with Black Bottom Street View and Black Bottom Archives are really about saying our stories matter, there's something there that it deserves to be told, and it doesn't actually matter about your celebrity status or if you happen to be one of the extraordinary people that people remember about Black Bottom, but that every person who lived there, all of the humans that made up this place, black folks and immigrant populations, right, all of them, uh, deserve to have stories that are told and honored and held sacred and really center that humanness that gets discarded a lot when we talk about development or when we talk about history, right? We, we talk in these events and we talk um, sometimes about locations and we don't always talk about the people that were involved in it, the people that were affected by it, the people that um, were exploited or harmed or cared for in all of it. So very important storytelling work in my opinion and really happy to be a steward of this work because I think that what it makes possible is a part of uh, this larger systemic change that we're trying to do. So I'm a community organizer, I'm somebody, I identify as a police and prison abolitionist, a surveillance, ab a surveillance abolitionist, and someone who really cares about community safety, true justice, and trying to figure out how we can relate to each other in ways that center caring for those who are most harmed, really caring for those of us who are often ignored and dismissed. And this work is not separate for that, from that. I don't see this work as very distinct and like exclusionary from this systems change work I'm doing because the power that we have to shape stories is not just some ethereal idea. We use stories in order to understand and position ourselves in opposition to other things around us and relationship and an interdependence to other things around us. And ultimately they allow us to determine what stories get told, who decides to tell them, who is an expert, what's considered valid or legitimate, what's considered valuable or not valuable. We can make those decisions in order to shape uh, more equitable futures and to really self-determine what we want our communities to look like so that we don't have to continue ex to experience that level of destruction and disposition. So I'm gonna wrap up and let other folks speak, but I just wanted to share a bit more about where I'm coming from with the work and excited to dig in more in conversation with the other panelists. Thank you, PG. Now we are going to have some data related to the events and cur current circumstances in Detroit by Ashley Clark, Vice President of uh, Detroit Future Cities. She's gonna give you the story in a different way. 
Can you guys hear me through my mask? Okay, I'm losing my voice, so bear with me, everyone. Um, so thank you so much, Gary, for this conversation. And I'm gonna call out our city historian in the front who has a shirt that says, knowledge of history isn't a luxury, it's a necessity. And so when I talk about data, and I might be a self-professed data nerd, but data alone does not have power. But data combined with history, combined with stories, combined with people who are doing actionable things can be powerful in leading change. And so at Detroit Future City, one of the places that we've been working on is around this concept of economic equity. And last year we put out a report that looked at what is the state of economic equity in Detroit. So I'm gonna share some of that context with you all about where we are today, context that many of you who live in Detroit are experiencing. So, Detroit Future City went through about a year-long process of really looking at what is economic equity. I'm sure if we were to go around to every single person in this room, you might have a different belief about what economic equity means to you and in your context. So we heard from over 500 people. We had youth, we had people representing civic organizations, neighborhood residents, to talk about this question, what does economic equity mean? And we came up with a shared vision, something that could be a catalyst, something that could mobilize us all to be working towards something together. So on the next slide is the vision. And what it calls for is a more economically equitable Detroit in which all Detroiters are meeting their unique needs, prospering and fully and fairly participating in all aspects of economic life within a thriving city and region. We also heard from people what matters to them. When we talk about changing economic equity, when we talk about shifting economic equity, what do we need to be focusing in on? So on the next slide are six of the things that really rose to the top. Income and wealth building, access to quality employment, business and entrepreneurship, education, health, neighborhoods, and housing. And from that, we came up with 22 different data points that could be used to inform us for where we currently are and to help shape and guide where we go in the future. So I'm gonna talk about some of those. There's a lot more. I have a copy of the report if you wanna dig into it. Um, but let's get started. So first up is income and wealth building. We really believe in that context of that vision that all Detroiters should be able to meet their unique needs and prosper by generate, accessing, generating, and maintaining income and wealth. And we know that there have been too many historical policies and current policies that have inhibited people's ability to access wealth, to generate wealth, to pass wealth on to their family members. And what we found when we looked at this is that there have been some increases in income in Detroit on the next slide, but we're at $34,000 is the median household income in Detroit. That's about half that of the surrounding region. So we know that we need to be looking at how do we increase incomes for people. And while there's been some progress around income in Detroit, what we actually see on the next slide is that we're seeing increased discrepancies as well. Disparities, sorry. So the blue line on this chart, the top line, you'll see that starting in 2017, we start to see a growing disparity of people by racial and ethnic identity, where we see higher incomes for white people who live in Detroit compared to lower incomes of black and Hispanic or Latinx households. And that matters. It's not just about do we increase incomes across the board, it's are we looking at closing gaps, are we looking at repairing historical inequities. So on the next slide, one of the things that we talk about a lot in our work at Detroit Future City, and we put out a report a few years ago that looked at the African American middle class in Detroit. Because when we talk about income, when I had that vision statement and when I talked about what income or goals are, I said not meeting basic needs, I said meeting our unique needs. It is not enough for somebody to live in poverty and meet their needs. People should be able to thrive. They should be able to support their family and achieve the things that they want to achieve. So when we talk about our work, we talk about a lot, what is a middle class income? What, can it, what do we need to get to so people can really meet their needs as a household? So what this looks like in Detroit is between $52,000 and $131,000. This is based off of the national median household income. Why this is important is on the next, if you click, two-thirds of Detroiters make less than $50,000 a year. 
So we really need to be talking about solutions to help elevate incomes and help people achieve middle class incomes so they can succeed. So on the next slide. This also is really important because in the last 10 years, we have not increased the share of middle class households in Detroit. It has remained stagnant at 27%. This makes us having one of the lowest shares of middle class households in the country compared to the top 100 cities. So we know this is an area that we can focus on. How do we increase the incomes of Detroiters? Next slide, please. Now this slide is showing cost burden. So a lot of times when we talk about incomes and we talk about housing, we look at this measure of how much is the household spending on their income or on their, um, their housing. And we say that a household shouldn't be spending more than 30% of their household income on housing related expenses. And what we find in Detroit, that while there are certainly challenges around housing affordability and housing quality, one of the biggest drivers of housing cost burden in Detroit is income. So if you were to increase incomes, if you look at the bars, it's hard to see, but $50,000, once you hit households earning $50,000 or more, housing cost burden significantly increases. So if we address income issues, we're also addressing affordability challenges. Not to say that we don't also need to address affordability on the housing stock side as well. Next slide. So how do we get there? What are some of the things that factor into this? Education is key. We believe that in a more economically equitable Detroit, our educational system would be preparing people adequately for the workforce. But what we find in Detroit on the next slide is that having a degree matters. So we looked at what does someone earn if they have a four-year degree versus they don't have a four-year degree. And it's a $15 per hour wage difference for having a degree or not having a four-year degree. So a degree matters. The challenge on the next slide is that more than 80% of Detroiters do not have a four-year degree. So as we think about solutions, we need to be looking at both how to increase educational attainment, as well as how to figure out creating opportunities for people who don't have that four-year degree, but who deserve to earn just as much. The other thing that I'll point out here as we talk about education and the need to increase education is we also have about 42% of our Latino population that doesn't have a high school degree. So education has to be part of the conversation. On the next slide, what I like to say too is that having a degree is not the great equalizer either. We still see disparities that even for people who have four-year degrees, we see disparities by race, we see disparities by gender identities. So some to call out is that African-American workers with a four-year degree earn about $8 per hour less than white workers with a four-year degree. Women, people who identify as women, earn about $11 per hour less compared to people who identify as men. So as we talk about education, as we talk about the importance of degrees, we also have to keep in mind that we need to focus on closing those gaps. Next slide. So what does this mean for jobs? What we believe is that regardless of educational status, somebody should be able to enter the middle class through having a job that pays a wage that allows them to do so. So one of the things that we talk about is this concept of a middle wage job. So what is a middle wage job? A middle wage job is a job that somebody without a bachelor's degree can hold, and it will pay at least the median wage for the region. And what we found in Detroit on the next slide is that we're seeing an increase in the share of low wage, or sorry, of um, low wage but accessible jobs. So that are, those are jobs that somebody without a four year degree can have, but it's not gonna allow them to enter the middle class. It's a low wage job. We're seeing a decline in the share of middle wage jobs. So again, those are jobs accessible to somebody without a four year degree and offers a wage that will allow them to earn a, a middle class wage. And this is important because we need to be investing more in these middle wage jobs and creating opportunities for people. And while it might look like it's a 2% decrease, for example, of middle wage jobs, that equates to a couple thousand jobs. It's about 2,000 jobs. Next slide. And one of the ways that we think is really important to be able to increase wealth, to increase income, is to make sure that we're investing in our small businesses. 
And so when we talk about Black Bottom, Hastings Street, an entire commercial corridor that was wiped out, opportunities for people to transfer wealth to future generations through businesses. We know that if we invest in our minority-owned businesses, we will be able to transform our economy. But these businesses need increased supports and access to capital. Because what we have in Detroit on the next slide is a situation where Detroit has one of the lowest entrepreneurship rates in the country and significantly lower compared to the rest of Michigan and the region. Detroit needs to be a place where someone who wants to start a business and succeed in having a business can thrive. Next slide. So the last piece I'm going to talk about is neighborhoods. We're here to talk about Black Bottom, which was a neighborhood. Um, and when we talk about neighborhoods, we want to make sure that we're creating places where people can thrive. Um, and so we need to be investing in strong and vibrant neighborhoods. But on the next slide, what I'll show you is in the pink, those are what used to be middle class neighborhoods. We looked at data from 2010 to 2019 and we said, where are the middle class neighborhoods in Detroit? And where have we gained? Where have we lost? Where is there stability? The purple are the neighborhoods that were stable. They were middle class in 2010. They were middle class in 2019. The pink ones are the neighborhoods that are no longer considered middle class. And on the next slide, the blue, those are the areas that are now middle class. And you'll notice that those are predominantly downtown. And a lot of that is due to higher income development that is not necessarily built for Detroiters. It's predominantly occupied by higher income white households. So we need to be focusing on, on strategies for helping to maintain neighborhoods as middle class, bring middle class, bring neighborhoods that are close to being middle class up and really strengthen and invest in these neighborhoods. We need to be creating places where people can thrive. Next slide, please. Where this also comes into play is when we talk about specifically our African American, our, our black middle class households. You know, it's in, that we are looking at strategies to grow and retain our black middle class. And what we found is that in the region, white middle class households are more likely to reside in a middle class neighborhood compared to African American middle class households. And in fact, if we look at our black middle class households across the region, more than 50% of them don't live in Detroit. The challenge is, is when people become middle class, they leave. So we need to be able to identify policy solutions and opportunities to grow people into the middle class and make sure that we're creating neighborhoods that people want to stay in once they enter the middle class. Next slide, please. We also found that Detroit is now a majority renter city. Um, this change happened a couple, several years ago, but Detroit used to be a beacon for black home ownership. We now have a home ownership rate of about 48% compared to 70% in the region. And this matters because home ownership is a key way in this country still to generate wealth and generational wealth. Um, and what we found in some recent work, um, and Chase is going to go much more in depth about this, is that there are challenges around accessing home ownership in Detroit. My colleague Kimberly Faison leads up our work around um, community economic development and our housing compact, which is diving into this very specifically. On the next slide, um, it's just a statement. You know, we know that home ownership, a mortgage loan, it's not just a pathway to home ownership, it's a building block of economic equity, neighborhood stability, wealth building for people of color, yet we know that there are challenges and there are um, inequities that exist around historic, you know, still the legacy, talking about history, the legacy of historical redlining, of predatory lending and the subprime mortgage crisis. We know there are current inequities and in policies that exist that are influencing people's ability to access home ownership, disparities in home appraisals, and access to credit, or even the role that credit plays. And so we need to be thinking about solutions related to housing and home ownership as well, which I know Chase is going to be talking a lot about from a development perspective. Um, so with that, there's three frames that we like to talk about as we think about progress moving forward. And so on the next slide, those three frames are, as we think about policy, as we think about solutions, as we think about this through a variety of ways, there's one approach is, are we seeing equal improvements? Is everyone improving at the same rate? All right, everybody's going up. That's wonderful. 
But is it just? Are we closing gaps? It's not just enough for everybody to improve. We need to be closing gaps. The last one, though, and that's a word that you have heard several times today, is progress reparative. Are we accounting for historical injustices and are we making sure that we are closing those gaps in a way that offset those historical inequities? So with that, I will say thank you so much. Um, on the next slide, we have a call to action of sorts. Because as we embark on this work and as we do this work, the whole purpose in us coming up with this shared vision of economic equity is because this is not work that happens in isolation. It happens through storytelling. It happens through acknowledging our history. It happens through advocacy. It happens through philanthropy, community organizations, everyday residents. Um, and so this is just our call to action to work collectively on this topic of economic equity. And if you'd like to learn more on the next slide, we have a, um, if you go to Detroit Future Cities website, we have a dashboard that includes all of this information and more that I've talked about today, if you want to dive into the data. Um, also, if you want to snag me, I can write down your information and I can get you a free copy of our report if you'd like to dig deeper and have it as a resource. So, thank you all so much. pattern of the circumstances of the day and how we can address them. I'm, I will be advocating for you and again to take her up on her offer to connect with the Church Future Cities. This is not just a panel, this is actually a process by which we are actually moving forward and making a movement that can actually improve the current circumstances. If we want a just and equitable city, we have to be willing to get engaged in making that happen because nobody's going to make it for us. Last but not least, I want to talk about somebody who actually is trying to make it happen, Chase Cantrell, who is Executive Director of Building Community Value. He's a current developer, and he will be talk giving you a, a perspective on economic development in Detroit and of projects that he is also involved in. All right, good afternoon, everyone. So it's so wonderful to see so many familiar faces and so many people who are also doing amazing work in the city. So I'm glad you all came out on a Thursday afternoon to join us to talk about this. Um, I'm gonna be looking at uh, economic development in the city of Detroit, but really from the built environment lens. So we're gonna be talking about real estate um, and sort of mirroring what happened in Black Bottom and what's happening in Detroit right now. So next slide. So I wanna start with property taxes in the city of Detroit. Um, so currently Detroit has the highest property tax of any big city in the state. To sort of put this in perspective, Grand Rapids, which is the second most populous city um, in the state of Michigan, has half the property tax rate that Detroit has. So we are double. So when Ashley talks about some of the challenges to home ownership in the city of Detroit, this is one of the real barriers that drives away our uh, middle class to the suburbs where you have lower tax rates. Um, our income tax, similarly, is the highest in the state. We are almost at our statutory maximum. Um, so the sort of quality of life that you have in the city is burdened by these systems that really are extracted from people who live and work in the city. As many of you know, um, and I'll talk about this in future slides, but you know, we have lost a lot of the home ownership, to Ashley's point. We are now a majority renter city. But when you lose your home, um, and you have to, in the future, try to regain home ownership, you're actually subject to something called uncapping. So if you own a home, my parents bought their first home in 1971 on the west side of Detroit. They still own it for 50 years. Constitutionally, in the state of Michigan, you, your taxes can only increase by a very small amount each year, right? And this really is to um, provide a benefit to homeowners in the state of Michigan for people to stay. If you've lost your home, um, and you have to go out and buy a new one, those taxes are adjusted upwards, right? So there were a lot of black Detroiters who lost their homes in the past decade, um, and they also lost that built up protection that they had in their homes to the very high property taxes that we have in the city. Um, we also have something that uh, really impacts us in, in the area close to here is the Downtown Development Authority. So, you know, we've all noticed that downtown has been built up. There's a lot of development that's happening. There's a lot of shiny new buildings, new restaurants, new amenities. 
Um, but the taxes that are paid downtown, much of that gets captured by um, another public corporation, the Downtown Development Authority. A municipality has to create this, we have to elect into it. So Detroit, years ago, elected to have a DDA. But that tax capture keeps the money downtown. So all of the benefits that we're seeing, um, all the property taxes that are coming in through the DDA, a lot of that is being reinvested into the downtown. But by statute, that money that's captured and kept there cannot be spent for our neighborhoods. So we're seeing high property taxes, we're seeing uncapping, and we're also seeing the capture of some of those taxes into a very concentrated area um, in downtown Detroit. Next slide. So I mentioned the foreclosure. This is not news to anyone here. Um, but when you begin to look at the numbers, um, really starting in uh, really 2008, but from 2011 onward, we're talking about tens of thousands of Detroiters who lost their homes. Um, 2011, we almost had about 20,000 people. And um, similarly in 20, 2011, 2012, 2013. So I mean, just the catastrophic number of people who, uh, who were foreclosed on um, really started about a decade ago and we're still suffering from and living through the impacts of those things today. Next slide. Part of this started with the loss of value in the homes in the city. Um, if you look over a decade ago, property values, median property values in the city were upwards of $80,000 per home. They plummeted to less than $20,000. You know, these homes were um, severely undervalued. What, what ended up happening though systemically is that the city didn't readjust the taxes, right? So you have a home that was once worth $80,000, it plummets to $20,000. The city is still saying that it's, only, that it's still worth $80,000 and taxing people at that rate, which is why in the previous slide you saw so many people foreclosed upon. They couldn't afford to pay those taxes on something where the value had actually been lost. Next slide. And then compounding that um, is the fact that if you wanted to access financing, the traditional way that we buy homes in the United States, banks weren't lending. You know, so in the noughts, you know, you could go to a bank, upwards of 6,000 to 8,000 mortgages were happening in the city of Detroit each year. After the uh, recession hit, it plummeted to about 200 per year. So down from 6,000 to 8,000, down to 200. We have begun to rebound. We're, we're back in the thousands. So this doesn't go all the way out to, you know, I think 2020 is probably the most recent data that we have. So we're back in the couple, couple of thousands, two, over 2,000 mortgages in the city of Detroit, but we're still not back to the historical averages where we were before. Um, and I don't have the slide, but Detroit Future City has done some amazing work as well to show that there are disparities in even that 2,000 number. There are disparities in who's getting the mortgages. Um, more white home buyers are getting mortgages um, than their black counterparts, and it's not what some might traditionally think. It's not credit score, it's not income. People, black home buyers with higher incomes are still getting denied at higher rates than white home buyers with lower incomes, worse credit scores, et cetera. So there's true racial disparity in access to financing. So we have overtaxation, we have loss of homes, we have inequitable access to financing. So as you see, um, in similar ways to what happened um, in Black Bottom, with people being denied the right to really live in place, there are systemic reasons that it is very difficult as a black person to own a home in Detroit currently. Next slide. So I talked about the overtaxation. Um, so a few years ago, there was some incredible research that was done, and, and this has become a real uh, advocacy point in the city that the overtaxation rate was up to in, in maybe even more than $600 million. So in thinking about the stripping away of black wealth from Detroit residents, $600 million at least over time from the recession forward. There's a great coalition. You probably know some of the folks that are involved, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib and others, the Coalition for Property Tax Justice, who are demanding um, in a reparations framework that people who were overtaxed and who were proposed upon actually have some form of reparations to um, to really provide justice for the harm that was done. We heard earlier uh, the term gentrification. I tend to 
stick away from the term a little bit because everyone has a different definition of what that term means. Uh, so I try to talk about displacement, right? Um, and traditionally, if you, if you hear the word gentrification, you're probably thinking of um, a white body replacing a black or brown body in space. Um, but you know, it could not, it's not only physical displacement, but some talk about economic displacement, cultural displacement, and even spiritual and psychological displacement, right? So there are different forms of impacts that our communities are suffering from. Um, but with all of that, there's a pretty clear wealth transfer from black homeowners. So if you think about what happened post foreclosure, we had the ramping up of the Detroit Land Bank Authority. It holds the inventory for a lot of the, the homes that were foreclosed upon by Wayne County. Uh, upwards of 100,000 parcels of land went into this land bank, over 100,000. I think they're down to about 13,000 homes now, and there's still tens of thousands of vacant parcels in the land bank. But essentially, that inventory came into the land bank, and then they began to auction it off to the highest bidder. You saw um, national and international investors, you saw a cheap property in Detroit beginning to buy these properties up. Um, those auctions often were very difficult for black homeowners to, to match. Um, so a very clear direct wealth transfer from the foreclosure process. Ashley mentioned that we went from being the shining beacon on the hill, right? We were the largest city for black home ownership in the nation, and now we are a majority renter city. So again, that has real implications, that wealth transfer for um, how people live in Detroit. And although we're talking about data, uh, there's a real psychological and, and, and real world impact on people who have to suffer through foreclosures, through evictions, through displacement, right? And I don't think that anyone's really measured what that impact is on people qualitatively in the city of Detroit, but it's still something palpable. It's affected not just the people who experienced it, but people in their families as well. There are clear ripple effects for all of the things that we see in the data. Next slide. So, since we have such a high tax rate in the city, and the median income is only $34,000, as Ashley said, it's half of the um, area median income for surrounding communities, we, we have to have subsidies in place to make sure that people can stay in place. So it took some time to get some of these, but we do have something called HOPE, the Home Ownership Property Exemption. So if you are a low-income resident, you're able to, um, with a lot of paperwork and process, you're able to access a tax exemption so that you don't have to pay those high property taxes. But it's, it's a similar challenge for developers and entrepreneurs as well. So I think a lot of people have seen recently in the press that Dan Gilbert's Bedrock, part of the, the Rock Venture family of companies, wanted a $60 million tax abatement. They wanted to not have to pay taxes up to $60 million on their new Hudson development. But if you look around the city, so if you look at neighborhood level development, you also see that almost every project has a tax abatement in it. It is very difficult, again, because of the high tax rate, to actually make these numbers work in community without the tax abatements. And we keep focusing on the subsidy without actually focusing on the fact that we have one of the highest tax rates, not only in the state, but in the nation, right? Like we're looking for the Band-Aid, which is the tax abatement, and not the actual fix, which is lowering our property tax rates. Sorry. So similarly, um, other subsidies, I talked about the Downtown Development uh, Authority, but the city of Detroit, the state of Michigan, um, and the federal government, to make these developments work, there's so much subsidy that goes into projects because essentially, um, the market value, the market doesn't see the value in the properties here in Detroit in the same way that you would see in other communities. Um, even, even thinking about the, the Mies van der Rohe homes in Lafayette Park, right? at the highest going for $600,000, $700,000, those same homes would go for millions in other communities, right? So even our, even our best homes are undervalued by the market. The same happens in terms of commercial development as well. So you can buy a property, you can put millions of dollars into it, but the market will say it's not worth the actual construction cost. So, I mean, I'm living through this right now. So, I mean, Gary mentioned that I do development work, put $3 million into a project, financing, not my own money, but go to a lender, get enough money to do a construction project, 
the market will immediately say, post development, it is not worth the three million that we put into it. The only way that works is if there's governmental subsidy to fill the gap. But if that has to happen at every single level, almost every single project, there's not enough subsidy to build the kind of city that we want to see built. So there becomes the question by government, by developers, by community members, like what can we actually build and what can we save? And it's a very political question. Um, a lot of the dollars, again, get directed towards downtown. There are, there's a, there are strategic neighborhoods that been, have been named throughout the city where there's been concentrated investment into those neighborhoods. But again, with limited subsidy, uh, governmental actors have to make decisions. Next slide. So my small contribution to this is that there are so many Detroiters who have a vision for what their neighborhoods should be. Right? So there's so much land in the land, land bank. Every Detroiter has looked at a commercial property or a house across the street and said, I wish this could be and fill in the blank. Right? There's, no, there's no deficit of innovation and thoughts and vision in our communities. So do, about six years ago, I started an organization called Building Community Value that teaches Detroiters how to do real estate development in neighborhoods. And all of, all of the things that we've talked about, right, the lack of access to capital, the governmental interventions, the subsidies, these are all things that are still barriers to black developers in the city. But um, there have been 350 students who have gone through the program, and they've gone back out, many of them, and actually have done mostly small rehab, so one to four unit rehab, small commercial. We have another program that Capital Impact Partners, a local financial institution, has for, for black developers. Think of my courses like the uh, undergrad course at the university and Capital Impact being the graduate level course. So they're looking for folks to do $5 million or more projects, so the larger projects. And at the same time, um, because we know that there's inequitable access to these resources, both to financing and subsidy, uh, a group of black developers have created an advocacy organization called the Real Estate Association of Developers, called REED. So really to be able to, to go to the mayor, to be able to go to city council and power, the powers that be to say, hey, this is what uh, our vision is for the community and these are the kinds of resources that we need to actually make our visions come to life. But the necessity for that uh, actually came out of government. So our, the former uh, group executive of infrastructure, Arthur Jemison, before he left the city, gathered together about 40 black developers and said, hey, the white developers are talking to the mayor directly. You all should do something about this. Do you, do you want to create a formal group? Do you want to have a bi-leaky meeting with me? Do you want some avenue to get to the mayor directly because other developers are talking to him? So even he, as a black man, understood that something isn't equitable in the system and we have to create new structures to actually make this work for us. Next slide. So, talking about Black Bottom, this is a current photo of I-375. Um, so, this process of you know, repaving I-375, creating a boulevard, um, will never right the wrong. It will never undo the injustice that was done. Um, but this process started, I know it's, it's been in the press fairly recently, but it started in 2014, right? So in 2014, MDOT, City of Detroit, National Highway Administration began thinking of alternatives to I-375. It took them about three years to develop those alternatives. In 2017, they took those, I believe it was six alternatives, to, the, to residents, they had public meetings, uh, I don't know what the attendance at those public meetings were, but they started in 2017, um, to come down essentially to one alternative. So that's really what we're talking about now. Um, if you go on their website though, you'll see that really what they're talking about is just that. It's the creation of a boulevard, a four-lane four boulevard. Um, they quote that there's excess land that may be available, but they don't talk about what will happen to that excess land. That process hasn't really begun quite yet. So there's a danger, um, and I hope that more people will begin thinking about this and speaking about it, there's a danger that that excess land, if we're thinking about writing, you know, how we respond to history, that vacant land probably should be for black Detroiters, black developers, 
places that we can actually build and inhabit in space. This project, however, um, won't get under, underway the actual construction until 2027. So we still have a long ways to go before they actually break ground on anything substantive. So next slide. All right, so why does all of this matter? So one, um, my good friend Lauren Hood, who leads the Institute of Afro-Urbanism, talks about uh, the nature of black thriving in Detroit. She's trying to understand, in, in, in a similar way to, to what PJ do, PG does, um, the, sort of the qualitative stories and the things that actually allow for black people to thrive in the city. And she has three, three working definitions right now. It's audacity, it's agency, and abundance. Um, and I think what we're all talking about is not just how do black people survive in the city, which a lot of us are just surviving, but how do we actually build a city where black residents can thrive? And I think that's truly the goal. Um, and what I do in terms of actual ownership and control over the built environment, I really think that agency and self-determination are truly important, right? It's not just about giving input. It's not just about um, driving a process that someone else is leading. It's, it's actually about owning and leading the process and owning the actual land and space. Equity, I have this in quotation marks because especially in the nonprofit world, but in government as well, like we use this term so often. Like uh, in my sector, equitable development. In architecture, they talk about equitable design. Um, but oftentimes, equity seems to be input, right? It's can, can we talk to residents? Can we get them to show up to a meeting? Can we get their input? Um, not often enough is it thought of as actual ownership. So, you know, we've, we've, ownership has been stripped away not only during the Black Bottom period, but currently it is still happening. How do we get to a place where equity truly does mean, in the sense that you would use it in the corporate setting, in the business setting, ownership, right? You think, if you think of a stock owner in a large corporation, they have ownership, they have direction, they have information flow. It's more than just being involved in input, it's actually leading the process. I think a lot of times we've been talking about creating new things as well, the place making, but a lot of this, and this is, I love the reference to Sankofa, right, looking back to go forward, is also cultural preservation. Um, and, you know, I think about the importance of black developers as being able to incorporate the, the culture that we understand to be the culture of the city of Detroit into the new things that we are creating, right? We don't create in a vacuum. We're creating spaces that have cultural re relevance, that bring our life experiences into the spaces that we're curating and creating as we move forward. So, um, and not unimportant is the money, right? How do you actually preserve wealth? How do you pass it on to the next generation? And how do you continuously build upon that from generation to generation? Again, a lot of the things, there's so much vacant land in the city of Detroit right now. We're not, in my lifetime, we're not gonna see all of that built upon. How do we ensure that we are generating wealth, protecting it, and also passing it on to the next generation who will take the baton and continue to run with it? So final slide, and this might be my favorite. Um, so there was a billboard a few years ago. This may have been pre-pandemic. I don't quite remember the year, but um, Alicia Wormsley um, had, this, had this billboard. It was a Library Street Collective exhibit curated by Detroit's own Ingrid LaFleur. And the way that Alicia describes it is that it was almost like a, a science fiction joke. Like if anyone's a sci-fi nerd like me, you don't see black people, except for maybe, you know, Uhura in Star Trek. There weren't a lot, a lot of us in science fiction. Um, so thinking, what does it mean to say that there are black people in the future? Are we just there? Are we leading? Are we thriving? And you know, unless we make some systemic adjustments to how we're doing economic development in the city of Detroit, yes, there will always be black people in the future, but will we thrive there? And I think that's really the goal. So with that, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chase, for bringing it home on, for us. Um, we have a few minutes left if there are any questions that we have for any of our fine panels. Before we do that, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to uh, recognize the, 
level of expertise that we brought together this afternoon. Now, does anybody have a question? Yes, sir. Okay, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, so I, I appreciate the question. I was actually in a focus group earlier. Um, the land bank is trying to create a strategic plan, or they're thinking about creating a strategic plan, um, and they're you know asking community members who are who work in the space about their thoughts. But no, I don't think that the land bank's current policies actually help um, black home ownership or home ownership generally in the city of Detroit. Um, it's interesting, the, the current executive director, uh, when she was interim, she actually said in the free press, and in my opinion, she said the quiet part loud, she said that um, the land bank doesn't have enough capital to maintain the pro their properties, you know, tens of thousands of properties that they have, and that their goal is to try to get them off the books as quickly as possible, right? There's a speed component and there's a cost component. So they're not, they're not often enough thinking about can we, get this to a, can we get this property to a community development organization that can rehab it and then get it into a homeowner, to a homeowner in the community? Can we get proper financing so that someone can rehab the house and take ownership over it? Their goal, and this is the auction process, is to, is to get it out of their stock. It doesn't mean that th their policies can't change over time, but as currently written, they don't truly serve the home ownership um, goal. Sir, you in the back? You're going to have to speak loud, sir. question was a, regarding f a feeling that Detroit, that black people were being gentrified out of the community. I, I think it's true in, in certain sections of Detroit. Uh, my wife and I have lived in Elmwood Park, uh, which neighbors Lafayette Park, and in the old Black Bottom uh, area that we've talked about. Um, it's becoming whiter and whiter each, 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 uh, each month, uh, uh, to be sure. Now, from a historical standpoint, we have to acknowledge what some of us have talked about earlier. I mean, a lot of the black middle class started leaving this town 40 years ago. Um, for, and I, look, for, I choose to live in Detroit, but I certainly respect anybody's right to live where they want to live. Some of those decisions, as I've been told over the years, were for the education of their children. Uh, some of it was for, for um, reduced uh, uh, taxes, so a lot of the income tax and the other taxes that, we, that we've talked about. So I, look, I mean, I think it's, it's clear um, that there are certain sections of, the, uh, of this town that are being, and I, I tell you something, I, I like the, 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 the traditional definition of gentrification. I mean, I know it's more complicated than that, but generally speaking, at least in the history of this town, what it has meant is poor black people being displaced for middle class or upper middle class white folks. Now, that's clearly what happened in Lafayette Park, and to some extent, that's what you're seeing in Lafayette Park all over again. Um, but, you know, there are never, I, I've, I've learned in my years that there are no a absolutes, and so the narrative um, that there's a citywide effort to move black people out, well, I, I don't think it's true. I do, I do think it's true in certain neighborhoods. Look, I, I'm not an economist, um, but, I, but, I, but I do think, I, I, I want to 
take a, a shot at, at, at your question uh, with an answer. Um, you know, we, we, we've talked about the land bank, which is really a governmental entity um, and a fairly new one in, 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 term, in terms of the relationship to the, the larger story of black bottom that we're talking about. But, but I, I think we can all say, uh, we all know that it's just not what city government is doing or not doing. It's not what Lansing is doing and not doing. There's a whole history here, and Black Bottom tells the story of the lending and the racism in the lending industry. Racism downtown. When 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 Green Hut goes to uh, uh, Mayor uh, Jeffries in 1944, there are no black people in city council, and there wasn't going to be a black person for another 13 years. These were white guys that made decisions about what was going to happen in Black Bottom, they, just like they made decisions about I-375 and the freeway named after Jeffries and, and, and others. I mean, they, 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 they chose those routes. There were white men that didn't live in those neighborhoods. So it was easy to say, send 94 through, uh, you know, th through these communities and send uh, 96 through these communities. And so I, I think we have to acknowledge that it's just not you know, whether or not the city is doing its job. Um, there's enough blame to, to, to lie in, in all aspects of, of home, home ownership. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's banking, it's lending, it's policy downtown, it's policy in Lansing and policy in DC. If I could add to the question about the appraisal piece. So we did some research looking at um, home mortgages purchase. Oh, Ashley Clark with Detroit Future City. Um, so Detroit Future City released a report recently where we looked at um, home purchase sale data and we looked at what were some of the challenges that people faced in terms of being able to obtain a mortgage. Like why were they denied? Mm. And appraisals were certainly a factor and a challenge and we've heard that, or we saw it both in the data but we've also heard it in terms of people we've talked to and their home buying experience. And there's a researcher who's been doing a lot of work nationally on this topic, Andre Perry, Dr. Andre Perry. And what he's found in, and what we see here too is that when it comes to appraisals, and especially in Detroit, there's a lack of um, appraisers who would identify as people of color. You know, it's predominantly a white industry. There's also um, challenges with appraisers being familiar with the nuances of Detroit in the case of things being kind of on a block by block basis. So I think appraisals have certainly impacted people's ability to access home ownership and need to be part of when we talk about what the solutions are, we need to be talking about how do we do better training for appraisers and education on the Detroit market. Can I just say just one quick, really quick part to sure. that? So the, the market, and, and I don't just mean in Detroit, but I mean generally, the mar markets don't value blackness, right? Like the, when, when Dr. Andre Perry talks about the devaluation of black assets, it's not just Detroit. If you go to Baltimore, Memphis, New Orleans, any, any or black neighborhoods within, within white enclaves, right? The, the, the nature of black people being in space is devalued by markets. Um, and that's just the history of the United States and it continues to play out in present day. And the structures, to Ashley's point, whether it's appraisers, um, the lenders, title companies, like all of the real estate actors involved in valuing um, where we are undervalue assets in, in black neighborhoods. So it's, it's, it, it, it reflects the nature of markets in the United States. Sir, sir, I'm sorry. You, that, you had two questions answered. I'm going to have to move on to somebody else. Do you want to see that? 
<laughs> he is not a plan. <laughs> That's what you call a softball. You're going to hit it off the park. <laughs> so, so one of the things that we think is critically important is that since a black city has the need for its culture to be reflected through its institutions, that there ought to be institutions reflecting and supported and led by black people running those. Uh, uh, thank you, John, for that, for that question. Part of the mission of Plowshares has been to create its own artistic home so that we could be a beacon for artistic activity. We have a, we're very rich, not only in the fertile soil, but we're very rich in regards to the cultural community that we have here. A number of our, we, just to talk about Black Bottom, it was the home to a number of artists who went on to create great art. We had educators, a Nobel Peace Prize winner that came out of that community, Ralph Bunch, Della Reese, along with politicians that not only shaped policy here in Detroit, but in the state, and in some cases in the entire nation and the world. That's what is potential in the Detroit of the future, but you need institutions to help continue to reflect that. The stories that PG talked about have to be presented in a informative and entertaining way. And that requires institutions. And one of the things that we're desperately fighting for is to get a, our home so that we can be a place that hones local talent, that attracts talent from around the country who wants to be here because of the unique energy that it is in our arts community, and use ourselves as a catalyst for economic development, much like what Chase said. Um, we don't always look at the arts as something that's integral to how we move things forward, but they are. They are. You just think about the last two years of being closeted in your home and not being able to go to a concert, not being able to sit next to somebody and listen to somebody tell you a story in a dark room, not being able to experience what live performance is. We know we were hurting, right? That came because we weren't able to come together. Plashers have taken on a mission and we've invited ourselves in a principle called Harambe. All pulled together. It's, it comes from Kenya. It's a, it's a Swahili word that means just that, all pulled together. That we don't get things through individual effort. That we get things through partnering with other organizations. That's part of the reason why this panel was brought together. We want to be part of that group that helps move these initiatives of economic equity together. So I think that may have answered your question, but, we are, but we're in a mission to move things forward, and so that's, that's why we're doing this. I actually have something else to add to that, too. I think there's a lot of what becomes more possible when we don't try to only rely on the systems and the government, right, and, and these large institutions, but think about how do we create our own how do we build our own foundations and institutions that can self-sustain when we talk about self-determination? So much of that, for me, exists outside of the restrictions of the elected official and like municipal government paradigm outside of the nonprofit industrial complex. Like It really exists at the grassroots and at our ability to make human-to-human -human connection and create something that can support each other. And so I think so much of what I experience about black arts and culture in Detroit outside of what institutions or the city or whoever might deem as valuable is that we are always creating something. There's not a black owned theater space, but that doesn't mean black theater it doesn't happen here, right? It doesn't mean that black folks aren't creating spaces for us to share and create and to perform and to present and to amplify particular stories we want to tell. So I think part of why we started the archive that we have is because we can't just rely on institutions to do the work of assigning a value to us or preserving something we want them to preserve. We have to be in that practice ourselves. And we've got a history of that, right? As we all know, we'll, a lot of us will be at the uh, African World Festival this weekend. I mean, Dr. Charles Wright in 1965 started an institution mm -hmm. that, that collected black artifacts and black art. And some of you who were around, who were around at the time know that he's, it was a traveling exhibit before it was, yeah. uh, in, uh, uh, at, at one time, the largest African-American museum uh, in the world. And so 
uh, from a historical perspective, we've got a history of creating institutions, and I, I just always remind us of that when we, when we know there's more work to be done. Okay. This one last question, ma'am, yes? Um. Okay, okay, sure, 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 sure. Pacing Street. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, yeah, the Black Beach Church. The Gotham Hotel was condemned in 1963, and it's still vacant. There's some movement on there, but it's a piece of land. Marsha, you, you had a question? <laughs> They'll be made available. We've also recorded this, and the video will be made available so that we get done editing it together. No, oh, thank you, thank you. And take, um, I apologize, take my apology as, as an act of my heart, of my head and not my heart. Thank you. Uh -huh. But we were trying to pull together a panel that was bringing that high level of information that you request to focus specifically in the areas where we're looking at addressing it. Thank you. Yes, sir, one last question. Well, I will say that there is a renewed interest in learning more about not only Black Bottom, but Paradise Valley um, in the corporate community. 
I think a lot of us have been fortunate enough, Jaman and I know Marcia, uh, we, we're fortunate, I think, to get calls all the time to do presentations. Uh, and, and some of them are from corporate folks. I mean, I think there are a lot of younger, there are, there are a lot of younger people um, who want to know. But I know what you're saying, there needs to be not just having Marcia speak at, a, at an event, um, but you know, what are you doing to invest uh, in black community? Uh, somebody needs to invest in, uh, in, 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 in Gary Anderson's uh, vision, right? And, and, that, and, my, and my view is, in my view is that should be, it should be wherever he wants it. But if, if, if I-375 and Hastings Street, the old Hastings Street is being reimagined, I mean, I think that's, that's a grand space for uh, the headquarters of Plowshare Theater, if that's where Gary wants to be. But that's gotta be a relationship oftentimes between a lender, uh, like, like a banking community, or the banking community, and uh, partnering with uh, Gary to make that happen. And I think if there's some to-dos here, and I think this is where Gary's going, we have to make that noise. We have to make that demand, right? We have to say what we want and, and, and be willing to fight, fight for it. Right, right. Thank you, thank you for my, and I agree with you. We understand that. Um, it, the time is sh short, and in fact, we're close to when we were supposed to be shutting down. And so I, <laughs> I, I want to take a moment. I want to thank this, this panel, so thank you. Our, our thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chase Cantrell, Executive Director of Building Community Value. Ashley Clark, Vice President of Detroit Future Cities. P.G. Watkins, Executive Director of Black Bottom Archive, and King Coleman, local historian and also reporter for MichiganAdvance.com. I want to thank them all for bringing their that level of expertise and compassion to this subject. I also want to thank uh, Anika Goss. It's, it's funny to be completely honest with you. <laughs> when you have a crazy idea, as I do often, my wife can attest to this, and you approach a friend and say, well, you want to work on something that I think might help inspire the work that you're doing. I don't get a no. And I'm very happy that I, that, <laughs> that I didn't get a no because I think we, this is the beginning of something. Um, in September, on the 29th, I think, um, Detroit Future City is going to be doing an event continuing this conversation. So if you want to be part of a movement that will actually impact these issues, you should get engaged with Detroit Future Cities. If you want to learn how to document the stories of your family right. and neighbors, get involved with Black Bottom Archives. If you want to learn more, follow Ken Coleman, who does this on a daily basis on Facebook and throughout his other venues. And if you want to get engaged in learning how to create new spaces in this city that are black owned and black, black designed, get involved with the workshops that are uh, building community value. And if you just wanna go see a show, <laughs> I'm very fortunate I have a show coming up next week <laughs> called Hastings Street, hey. it's a world premiere musical. I don't know how that worked out. <laughs> but we're, we're excited about that because it's gonna be our official return to the stage after two years yeah. and yeah. several months sitting at home. So again, I want to thank you all for coming out. Um, and, I, and I encourage you, continue to be engaged in this work. This is the work for the next generation. This is the work that we do to build the city we want to see. Thank you. <laughs>